Hey, it looks like we are live. I am here today talking to Nick Spinoza. He is a Hack Reactor graduate, a new developer out there. How's it going, Nick? Hey, I'm doing really good. How are you doing, Eric? Great, great. We were just chatting before we started here, talking about interviews and questions. It's pretty fun. We all, we're, we're like, yeah, we got to start the interview. Yeah, we probably should. <laughs> so, so Nick, you know, I first got, I first learned about you. I was watching. Uh, Dylan's challenge channel coding tutorials 360 and uh, you did a couple of interviews with them and I thought it was really interesting because you have a really interesting story of how you went and you joined hack reactor so I guess we could start with uh, what is hack reactor and tell us tell us a little bit about your experience just uh, starting there sure uh, so hack reactor is a coding immersive um, they sort of have a few different options uh, their main sort of call to fame is they do a 12-week program uh, where it's approximately 12 hours a day, six days a week uh, for 12 weeks. Um, that's the one I chose to do. So I, I did that in fall of, of 2016. I finished up in December, and then I started my job uh, right in the beginning of February. Yeah, that's awesome. So the Hack Reactor, you said it's how many weeks? Uh, it's well technically it's 13 and there's like a break week in the middle uh, just to prevent you from getting super burnt out um, But yeah, it's really good super thorough Yeah, that's awesome. So they go everything from not just coding but also What to do and how to get a job afterwards and I heard their their Placement average is really really high like some of the highest of any old boot camp out there, right? Yeah, so um, sort of from day one uh, there's a real pragmatic focus um, where everything that you're learning is directly applicative to, to getting a job. Um, so we do spend, or we, they do spend a lot of time with uh, uh, with sort of the CS fundamentals uh, in the beginning. So I know there's a lot of boot camps that will just crank out like Angular guys or, or React guys, but uh, I could say with you know some degree of certainty that at least everyone I know that has been through Hack Reactor. It's a really solid understanding of you know data structures, algorithms, how sort of the nuts and bolts work uh, like under JavaScript, uh, which you know it, I think is really important, uh, especially in a, a field where everything is changing so quickly. Like it seems like there's another framework every other week, and if you have that good foundation, it makes it a lot easier for you sort of to move between the different tool sets. Um, and then the other thing that they do really well um, is they do. They do interview prep uh, and uh, negotiation prep really, really well. So, and towards the end of the program, uh, well, at the halfway mark, they have you start doing resumes, and uh, they have uh, a lot of people that will review it. So you'll go through many, many iterations of your resumes. I think I did like six or seven before they finally were happy with it. Uh, and then they spend a lot of time with um, interview prep and negotiation prep. So. Um, Basically, they'll pair you up with other students and have you guys interview together. Um, and then there's a lot of negotiation prep as well. And it, it was really good because by the time I got into actual whiteboarding interviews, I was like super confident uh, with having done it so much already. Yeah, and I want to get into that interview prep part a little bit and ask a few questions. But before then, you mentioned that um, the JavaScript, they really try to focus on the fundamentals and algorithms. Uh, specifically on JavaScript. So do you guys get a, a taste of different frameworks? Yeah, so uh, the way it starts out, they've spent like the first, uh, you have to forgive me because I am, it's been a while, I'm a little <laughs> bit foggy of the direct timeline, but they spend the first like week or two weeks on uh, data structures and algorithms. So you'll you'll crank out, you know, like all the basics, you know, your link lists, your stacks, your queues, your uh, BSTs, your graphs, you know. Um, and you'll go through some some algorithms. The the cool one that I remember a lot was was the n queens problem. You know, like if you have a chessboard of n length, put n queens on it. That's a that's a fun one. Uh, but then once you sort of get through that, and of course you're still like there's no way to grasp all of that in such a short amount of time. But of course that all is relevant and comes up as you progress. So once you you get through that foundation, then you start. You'll spend like two days with one framework, two days with another framework, and you'll sort of get a taste of of how they work and what is the right situation to use this tool for. Um, one of the things I see a lot, especially in the industry, is people have these uh, like fanatical relationships with the framework. 
whether it's like, I am a React guy, I will only write React. But at the end of the day, it's a tool, right? And you know, you don't use a hammer to, to screw in a screw. It's all about picking the right tool for the job. Uh, and Hacker Actor did a really good job of that. Uh, so by the time you get to the project phase and you're deciding what tools you want to use, you have a good idea of the whole ecosystem and where the tools fit in. Yeah, that's yeah, exactly. You got to pick the right tool for the right job. And I think we can all relate where we have some people that are just on one side or the other that come almost like a, yeah, they're, they're, they're just stuck in their ways, I suppose. And that's glad yeah. you're good. You're able to look at all different sides there. So going back to the technical interview prep, so you, what kind of preparation to, do they do for the technical interviews? You said that they do one-on-one -on -one coding, one-on-one uh, -on -one with other people to talk, uh, talk to other people about interviews and you guys kind of prep each other. What, what else is involved in that? Uh, so from from literally day one, every morning uh, you do you spend an hour uh, alone on an interview question, just like little coding challenges, you know, like stuff that you'll get, uh, you know, a lot of times for a take home test or even the harder ones are stuff that I've seen in, in whiteboard problems. Uh, so you'll spend an hour on that alone. And then you afterwards you you get a lecture where like the solution is explained. So you're doing this every day. So like by the time you're done, you know, you've done like close to a hundred of them. Um, so that's that's sort of like just pervasive through the whole thing. But then as you get to the end, they start spending more and more time on interviewing because uh, what a lot of people don't realize is like whiteboard interviewing is, is a skill in itself, you know, which is like fairly, I, I think orthogonal to the kind of programming that you do every day. So you need to specifically train that um, it's not something that you're going to just get naturally good at as you are making projects. Um, so as you get to the end, they spend more time. Uh, one thing that was really cool is they had two of the instructors interview each other. So you could see like people who are really good at, at JavaScript go through an interview question and how they think. And um, one of the things they, they emphasize a lot, which I think is important, is um, talking through the problem with your instructor as you're going through it, because uh, even if you know, you don't come to the optimal solution. It's always really good to, you know, show your thought process, your thought process, and the method through which that you solve it, um, because no one can expect you to know every problem there is. But what people want to see in an interview is the that you can figure out problems you've never seen before, uh, which is really what what programming is at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah that's something that I've actually failed on. I. Um, I went, I did an interview a while back and I got a problem, a whiteboarding problem, and I didn't know the answer to it. And the interviewer wouldn't give me any hints. Of course, that's not their job. So I started just writing it down. I think there was probably silence in the room for like five, probably 10 minutes while I was just writing everything down and kind of going back to it. And I remember saying a few words, but I think if I would have probably talked through every step I would have maybe done better or at least explained what I was doing better that's a definitely a problem I was missing yeah well it sort of does two things for you uh, you know one it it shows the interview the way you're thinking about it and how you're going through it but two it's almost like rubber duck debugging right if you if you say it aloud in a way that it has to make sense eventually it'd be like oh this is this is the assumption I was making that's actually wrong let me fix it. Uh, and it's, I, I would imagine, I mean, I haven't been on the other side of the, of the interview yet, but I would imagine that seeing that, you know, that you can have that moment is, is important. Yeah. I, I think my interviewer, I did so bad. They're probably like on Reddit or, or just watching YouTube videos while I was writing stuff down. Definitely wasn't my proudest moment, but now I have learned. And that was a while ago. That was quite a while ago. Yeah. I mean, that's, that's what's important. Um, I was reading, uh, there's a, a YouTuber I like, and I was watching one of his videos. Um, he used to, he did, he worked for Facebook and he said, uh, his opinion is that an interviewer did not do his job. If you felt you did well at the end of an interview, because the point is to take you as far as you possibly can go to see where your, your end point is. Right. Um, and that's why a lot of them are structured with like, here's a problem. Huh? What if we tweak it a little bit? Or what if we put this constraint? 
uh, can you do that in constant time, you know? So the a lot of the problems are structured in a way that they can get to one answer and then build a little bit and get to the next one. That way they can like stretch you as far as possible and really see, you know, sort of your bandwidth as a developer. That's 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 exactly what happened to me too. Yeah, after I, I came up with a solution, which I think worked, was like, well, what about this? If we tweak it like this and we add X, Y, and Z here, and then the problem becomes exponentially harder. So that's that's definitely true. Can if you were to give some tips for beginners to prepare for a technical interview, what what would some of them be? Um, I would say what really helps me, and this is another thing that Hack Reactor uh, advises you to do, is before you write a line of code, you should go through at, like your solutions um, in a sort of a language agnostic way, uh, just from the logic. And you should be able to debug your logic before you write code. You know, so like for instance, if you're doing some sort of like list iteration, you can say like, okay, I want to loop over the list and do X, Y, and Z with each with each value in the list, right? And it doesn't need to be you know list dot for each passing a you know a lambda. You, you want to be describing it in sort of like pure logic, agnostic of any language. Um, and that really helps me to sort of have a very good idea of what the the solution should do before you sort of transcribe it into you know whatever language you're working in. Um, and being able to debug the logic, I think, helps a lot so you don't get bogged down in syntax. So, uh, try to, so first thing to do would be try to write down the problem that the interviewer gives you in an in a agnostic language form just to try to understand the logic and flow of your answer. Yeah, so like almost like pseudocode. Yeah. Okay, right. Yep, that way you can you know you can then just debug that and by the time you go to write javascript or write out your function, you already know how it, how the how it should work. So then you're just putting it into javascript syntax. Um, mm -hmm. so that's one thing that really helps me. Uh, the other thing is and I think I mentioned it before that like interviewing is its own skill. And personal projects is not going to help you. Or I should say it's going to help you, but not enough. You, so you need to specifically train it. Um, so two problems. Uh, I like Code Wars. They're not great, but they're they're good. Uh, the better thing to do would be to um, try to find, if you can find examples of interview questions your company has given before. Uh, Glassdoor is a good one. If you're working with a recruiter, Usually, they can tell you what their other candidates have said and give you some feedback. So, as much information as you can get when you have a specific place, uh, you know, is really helpful. Yeah, definitely going back and talking. I, that's that's I've done that before in other interviews. Just looked at Glassdoor and taking a look at the interview questions to try to yeah. get an idea if I can kind of figure out what they're what they're doing, um, what I should I expect. I know some recruiters are better than others. Some recruiters will kind of give you like a whole litany of things that you should study and some others are less are a little more cryptic of what you should study yeah i've been through through both sides of the gambit um for me like one of the big flags uh, at least in the javascript community or or ecosystem i guess um you know a lot of times they'll give you like a take home test or some sort of phone screen before they'll even work with you uh, and i had a, a few recruiters that gave me like manual DOM manipulation with like just the JavaScript methods. And I was like, I remember thinking to myself, there's no one in the world that is doing this today. <laughs> uh, so you can sort of figure out, are you going to feel for, you know, how technical your recruiter is at that phase? And then you can know how much you can expect to get when you get to the interview uh, process. Now, what about, and you talked a little bit about this with Dylan. Uh, I'll link that in the, in the show notes below, but there is there's certain things to say about soft skills in your interview. I I don't think it's as I kind of disagree a little bit with Dylan. He thinks he said that that was really important during interviews. Like if you can make your interviewer laugh, that you might have a better uh, chance of getting a job. But I've also seen the opposite where, well, if it doesn't matter how much your interview lasts, if you can't pass the whiteboarding interview, you're not going to get the job. Yeah, I, I sort of agree with, with both of you. I, I think there is 100% a technical bar that you have to meet, you know, and you have to get there. It's just hard and fast, no matter, you know, who you know or how much they like you, it doesn't matter. 
But once you get to that bar, I think at that point that your soft skills are probably going to be more influential than your technical skills, unless you're just like crazy out of this world, you know, like the next Ada Lovelace. <laughs> um, so, but of course there's a technical bar. If you can't do the job, then they're not going to hire you. But if you can do the job and, you know, you can convince them that you know, you're one of them, it's going to set you ahead of the pack, I think. Yeah, that's good. That's a good point. Yeah. So I guess it's a little bit of combination of both. So there is definitely, doesn't matter how, how much they like you. There's definitely a bar you have to pass technically. Now there's two types of technical bars. I mean, we've been talking about kind of about the traditional whiteboarding algorithm stuff that Hack Reactor was really doing a good job and teaching you guys and getting you guys used to thinking about how to pass those. Now there is other types of interviews out there where you just mentioned take home interviews or take home test interviews. I mean, how many, when you were looking for a job, I mean, was it like 50, 50, or is it like 70, 30, or? I would say it was, I would say it was like 80, 20 whiteboard. But that being said, I know the East coast is notorious for it. Uh, and then a lot of the people I worked with at hack reactor that are on the West coast had a very different experience. Um, what I've noticed, you know, and I don't know if it's a correlation versus causation thing, uh, more of the startups I apply to were um, much more likely to send me a take home test and all of the big companies, you know, want to take you in and, and do, a, you know, like three whiteboarding interviews. Um, personally, I think take home tests are far more effective, um, you know, unless you're like doing some really crazy like systems engineering, you know, in C and you really need efficient algorithms and all that crazy manual memory management and stuff. Most of the time, you're not going to be writing, you know, a heap or a sorting algorithm. You'll probably just use the ones that are built in, because most of the time, developer time is worth far more than processing time. Uh, you know, we're fortunate to be in a per, uh, profession where we get paid very well, and if you can implement something quicker, that's more maintainable uh, and more testable, that's oftentimes far superior than writing the most you know, optimized solution, uh, at least in my experience. Um, now, did the take home test just get you in the door? But then when you went to the site, were you then grilled on like basic JavaScript questions or CSS questions when you actually got into the interview? Or of course it depends on the employer. Uh, I've sort of seen like two distinct different take home tests. One where it's like, like you said, like the tech screen where they give you a test and sometimes it'll be like literally like a multiple choice test and just to, so you know what JavaScript is. Um, other times it'll be like a little like problem in like a repo classroom or something. Um, and that's like one, and that's that's what I see a lot when there's like a ton of applicants and they're just like, okay, we'll give them all this and some of them won't do it and we could just cut them off, right? And not worry about, because there's someone that has to read through all those resumes yeah. at the end of the day. Um, and then the other one is sort of like the interview replacement. Um, like one I remember is my friend had a company asked my friends to implement like a simple React Redux app. You know, obviously they gave him specifics, but I don't remember what they are. Um, and I think that is a lot more indicative of the work that you will actually do as a developer. You know, uh, if you write unit tests for everything and your code is really dry and well abstracted, like that, I think far shows your skill as a developer more than you know if you can whip out some crazy like binary heap, you know? Yeah, I think um, that dovetails really nicely into my next question. I, I, I think if um, you've seen, you've probably seen this, that there's kind of this backlash against whiteboarding interviews lately. Um, there was a bunch of tweets going around that. Yeah, let's see that. Saying, <laughs> exactly, yeah, you, you're using my open source project in your whole company, but yet I can't uh, write a bubble sort from scratch. You're not gonna hire me or or um, one of the GitHub repos going around now by a, a, a lady named Lauren Tan, which um, works at Netflix, used to work at Dockyard. I, I know her from there. She created a GitHub repo that like lists companies that don't require whiteboarding interviews because they're so hateful of that. What do, what do you think about all that? Yeah, I mean, I tend to agree. Uh, I'm pretty pragmatic where like, I know if I get good at whiteboarding interviews, I'm going to get better jobs. So like, I, I don't, I'm not going to complain about it. But at the same time, if I was interviewing, I don't think they're effective. And I 
don't they're not a good time for anyone involved so uh you know i would like to see less of them but at the same time especially for people that are you know we're in a similar position to me and trying to break into the interview it's not going to change in the next three months so you might as well like hunker down and get good at it yeah i don't see google changing their interview process anytime soon or amazon for that matter yeah yeah i agree i am you know smaller companies startups you know you might see less of them my friend just started working at snap uh, at snapchat and he didn't have to do a whiteboarding interview for them so you know maybe it's the way of the future but not right now anyway you know this seems like kind of funny it's like if you were it really the whiteboarding interviews i think really complement people that are good at preparing and studying and maybe even people that are coming right out of like a boot camp like hack reactor where they've been taught and really enforced how to do these interviews or people that are coming out of the university with a CS degree and that took algorithm classes. It feels like some of these interviews, it's just up. If you just spent, I don't know, two months and spend one day or an hour every day doing um, coding problems off of, there's a bunch of websites that offer these algorithm type problems for testing like leak code. And there's a book called cracking the coding interview. And there's, another book called elements of uh, programming interview. Like if you just spent just doing these, these problems one a day for like a couple of months, you could probably pass most of these whiteboarding interviews and you wouldn't necessarily really know how to program anything else. You wouldn't know any, you could, you could, have, you could know nothing about CSS or selectors or HTML or JavaScript, but you could just be good at this and be able to get an interview and pass it. So it seems like it emphasizes just studying more than you know what you can actually accomplish yeah i i really agree it's it's a very disparate skill um and which is you know i don't think they're effective for that reason you know you can get good at just whipping up algorithms but it doesn't make you a good developer um that's why i think really talking your way through it um it helps a lot because even if you aren't great at algorithms and i'm not but if you can show the way that you attack a problem and you know break it down into smaller problems i think that gets you really far yeah, for sure. Um, I just have a couple more questions on the Hack Reactor process there. Do they have any, uh, do they encourage you guys to blog, to do like interviews like on, like we're doing now, or create more of a GitHub repo? I think I've seen a bunch of Hack Reactor students repos. Yeah, what... so they actually enforce blogging. I am horrible with it since i left hack reactor i, I want to get back into it more um eventually this week this week i'll do it uh so everyone actually blogs while they're in hack reactor which is really good um having an internet um like profile or internet uh, i guess like aesthetic is is super important especially in the job market now um you know when you're looking for a job, you want to avoid going at the front door, if, if possible, of course. And if you can find someone that is a follower of your blog or, you know, you know that someone is into topic X and you wrote a blog post on it, you know, it's an easy way to create a connection really quickly and sort of find other ways into the, the hiring process than, than through the front door. Uh, so it's really important. As far as YouTube interviews, uh, I, I've always loved YouTube, YouTube as a platform, so uh, I like doing them. All right. Is there any uh, final advice that you have for people? Um, we're not going to get into the nitty gritty details of Hack Reactor, but do you have any other advice for people that are looking to get into some technical interviewing and they're trying to they're trying to prepare? Um, any other final thoughts on that? Um, like I said before, and, and you mentioned it as well, is uh, consistency is really important. You know, if you do like eight problems a day, you're going to burn yourself out and it's not going to be, you know, as effective as if you just do one or two problems a day. So give yourself, you know, a couple months before you enter the job search, you know, to, to really get good at it because you're going to see it. It's just a, it's just a fact of, of the process at this point. Um, then the other thing I wanted to mention, um, if anyone is interested in Hack Reactor, uh, they actually just started a new program. The first class will be in uh, April, I believe, uh, where they're doing it over nine months, and it's a part-time program, so you can keep a job, and you know, especially for people that have families, uh, it's a really good solution. I actually have a friend who's going to be starting 
in there as well. Um, it's just a, another option, and I, you know, I think it's really good for a lot of people. Uh, so you can just go right to hackreactor.com to read about that, or you can ping me on Twitter or, or my email, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Cool. And where can we reach you on Twitter and email? Uh, you can reach me at Nick S J S on Twitter or uh, Nick Spinoza 1022 at Gmail. Okay, great. Thank you, Nick.